2020 has been a wake-up call for many Americans showing how things can quickly take a turn for the worse. We experienced prosperity and calm for quite some time before this year, but we've quickly seen how that can change. One disaster or perceived calamity can cause panic. More than one catastrophe at the same time could lead to a prolonged grid-down situation. While the region might recover after a few days or weeks, a national incident could leave you on your own with no help coming. If a significant enough event were to occur that completely disrupted our supply chains and resources, the results would be catastrophic. Most people don't have enough food or water on hand to survive much more than a week. In this video, we'll cover what you can expect when a national disaster over 90 days occurs and how you can prepare now. Please consider subscribing to our newsletter to give you updates and membership specific content. Visit www.cityprepping.com forward slash newsletter or click on the link in the description and comments section below to subscribe today. Enjoy the video. Any disaster on a national or global scale can quickly turn neighbor against neighbor. The calm social order you enjoy will be flipped on its head just after a few days. The sad reality is that most people aren't prepared to survive to next week if supplies were cut off, let alone for 90 days or more. There is, however, a timeline that generally follows disasters. Knowing this timeline can put you one step ahead of the herd and keep you safer amidst the chaos. This video will analyze the days, weeks, and months following a catastrophic national disaster. I'll tell you what you can expect along the way and provide you with solutions you will need to remain safe and survive. The first three days. Depending on the national disaster, the first 24 hours can be relatively calm. If you're in the aftermath of a storm or an earthquake, this is a period where people are emerging from what is left of their shelters and making sure they are unscathed. If it's a disaster like a national power outage, most people are still relatively calm. We put a great deal of faith in our government, public services, guard, and military to restore our world following a disaster. This period of calm can last for about two days. After that, things begin to reveal how broken they really are. Stores that cannot process credit and debit transactions cannot sell to people without cash, and banks that cannot process deposits and withdrawals stop functioning. Just-in-time delivery services that replenish grocery and pharmacy inventories can't do so, and shortages of some items begin to occur. This fuels even more panic buying, which further exacerbates the problem. After 72 hours, people will begin to realize that help is not coming and systems will not be restored. A stress level of the community will start to boil over. If stores haven't been looted yet, it will surely begin by the third day, as those who fail to prepare will desperately try to grab up the resources they now realize they need. If you have prepared, you can avoid being caught up in this dangerous time of desperation. If you have not, expect to be stuck with the herd making runs on stores. Likely, the police will not be able to keep ahead of the crime. Local curfews will be established, perhaps even martial law. What should you know about and do in the first 72 hours? Your first 24 hours is a little bit of a golden window for you to act. You'll need to decide if you're going to shelter in place or bug out. You should immediately fill every container you have with water in the likelihood that pumping stations will cease to operate. Your water may be gravity fed with those enormous tanks you see on the hillsides around your town, but those will not be replenished in a prolonged grid down situation. If possible, you should gas up your vehicle. Within the first 24 hours, if you need to go to the store, do so with cash if there's any supplies you need to top off. But again, only do this if you have no other option, as it is likely that people will be in a state of panic. So don't plan on this being your primary plan if you fail to prepare. Evaluate accordingly based on the knowledge of your local stores. In the first 48 hours, you should check in with your mutual assistance group if you've established these types of relationships. If you live in an apartment complex, you should coordinate a floor or billing meeting to discuss posting guards at the entrances and other strategies to keep your billing safe. Though phone and internet services may be down, apps like Bridgeify that utilize mesh networks may still allow you to communicate with others or get news. CB or ham radios can provide you with critical communication abilities. A CB should be part of your prepping supplies because they are very affordable and vital to communication capabilities. You should also monitor your emergency radio channels to assess the extent and area radius of the disaster and base your decision on whether to bug out or bug in based upon this information. If you have a police scanner, you can monitor the chatter to determine how the disaster's aftermath is unfolding. Don't give too much credibility to the word of mouth rumors and gossip. Especially don't base your decisions on this type of communication. Assuming you have prepped in advance, your most significant decision in the first 24 hours is going to be whether you should stay or go. 
Your window of opportunity will begin to close after the first 24 hours. Roads will begin to fill up and travel will likely not be a safe option any longer. Ask yourself, can I make it 90 days where I am? Even if the answer is yes, have a bug out plan and bag ready if the situation forces you out. Your solutions for the first three days are to have some preps in place already, along with a bug out plan. All members of your network or family could implement the communication plan you've already put in place before the disaster. You should monitor any potential compounding problems like nuclear power plants or dams. Most importantly, you need to assess whether staying in location or getting to a safer area is possible, which is your best choice during this golden window of opportunity. The first week. Within the first week, supplies will be gone, either purchased or stolen. Medicines will begin to run out, and people with medicine-dependent lives will turn to hospitals for what they need. Hospitals may not be able to admit and help many people if their power cannot be restored. Police, medical, and fire services will be overwhelmed, and you cannot rely upon them. The declaration of martial law is very likely as governments attempt to keep the peace. As we saw this year, people will likely not accept martial law. Vigilante security groups will probably spring up in neighborhoods and communities. Clean water may cease to flow and trash and human waste will begin to pile up. As sewage plants fill, municipal water supplies or local rivers may become contaminated. Natural gas and electricity will cease to flow. By the end of the first week, the levels of circulating cash will be very low, and bartered items like food, water, and durable goods will begin to rise in value. People will be either trying to leave populated areas or, for those stranded away from home when the disaster struck, they will just be arriving back to their city home if they decide to return home to find that the landscape has changed considerably. Remember, the golden window to either stay in place or bug out is really in the first 24 hours. After that, you are competing with a herd every step of your journey. Your solution for the first week is to take a mental inventory of your supplies and try to get all your family members or groups in one central defensible position. Do not share, even at community or billing meetings, the extent of your supplies. If you do, your supplies will likely be taken and divided up by the second week. You'll need to use a large bucket and trash bags to remove waste from your living area. If it's more than just you, a 24-hour watch system at your home must be established. The night will bring the greatest conflicts, as desperate people will try to use the cloak of darkness to keep them hidden. Martial law or local police may still provide some protection during the day. Beyond just your home, know what is happening in your neighborhood and community. Stay in the well-trafficked areas if you have to venture out during the day. Second week. By the second week, crime, looting, and marauding will rise. Stores and pharmacies will have already been looted. Mutual assistance groups will spring up in some communities, neighborhoods, and buildings. These will vary from street gangs to militias to armed citizens. There could be conflicts between these groups, though they will likely be pretty respectful of boundaries in early weeks. Your opportunity to travel has passed. Roads impacted by people fleeing population centers will be littered with abandoned vehicles and will be far too unsafe to travel. Many will be living out of their cars on rural land they could get to, and they will suffer being kicked out off that land by locals. International borders will be closed to stop the flood of refugees, and governments will issue stay-at-home orders, curfews, or attempt to relocate people in mass. With no sign of recovery, hospital and emergency workers will turn to their own families and communities. You'll want to keep as low a profile as possible. Make sure the windows are covered. Avoid cooking and lights at night. When cooking, add any spices after flame out to avoid releasing scents into the air. You'll need to purify any water you obtain that isn't part of your stores. Stay put and stay hidden. You'll not find food or medicine anywhere, so there's little point in venturing out. Your solutions for this period are to have the foods and medicine you need in your preps. If you've formed relationships with your neighbors, now is the time to start discussing food rationing and how you'll work together if you're not prepared. At this point, you've all decided to hunker down, so you're all in it together. Never reveal all your supplies, but it will be crucial for you to have a large supply of food stored as you may be the only resources your neighbors have. Always barter a cup of beans or rice or a couple of ramen noodle packets for things you know you will need in the weeks ahead. If someone wants to charge their item with the solar generator you have, you should try to have some costs associated with that. Otherwise, they'll be at your door repeatedly using your resources. Avoid giving away your valuable preps for nothing in return. You should have medical kits and books to allow you to care for yourself and others. The loaning of prepping books you've already read and do not need a reference is the only exception because you want your neighbors to be knowledgeable and not a burden. If sewage is down, you may need a community plan for removing waste from your living areas. Third week. By the end of the third week, 
seeing a car on the road or a plane in the sky will be a curiosity. If it's a car on the road, it likely will signify potential danger. Are there still no communication or signs of recovery? You'll be stuck where you are, and you should give up the prospect of any recovery at a national level. You'll have to rely upon your network for protection. Marauders will be an ongoing threat. It will not be safe to leave your network alone. If you and your group are to survive, your solutions are to delegate responsibilities based upon areas of expertise. Any current or former LEO or military should be in charge of implementing a security plan. Anyone with medical training will have to provide those services. Again, don't reveal all your food stores, but contribute maybe a pound of beans and a pound of rice. Those will feed several people and keep people from getting desperate. The reality that you're all in this together will sink in for many, so you'll need to provide direction to steer your community. Maybe loan a book or two to people who show they have some expertise. As a community, you'll need to obtain water by draining water heaters or pipes or setting up a rain collection system. You'll need to lead the thinking on these things. The ability to provide survival knowledge to your community will make you an invaluable asset. One to two months. By now, things are up to you and your community for survival if no help is coming. As a prepper, you will become a valuable resource if you can help your community. Tough decisions will have to be made, rationing of food within your home. Roles will have to be established and skills brought to the table for everyone to work together. Many envision that after a significant disaster and no help is coming, that they'll simply be an island to themselves. The reality is that this will not be the case. People will know what you have, and if you haven't started forming ways to help others near you that can help you in return, you may have an angry mob at your doorstep. While many in the prepper community envision that they'll be fine making it independently, if you live in an urban or suburban environment, this simply will not be the case. Remember, manpower will be critical for survival. The notion of just sitting on a stockpile of food is simply not realistic, as others will figure out quickly who has food and who does not. It is in this moment that working with and not against your neighbors will enable everyone to survive. Three months. After three months, it will be apparent that rescue isn't coming. Governments won't restructure. After such a long natural disaster, any government that shows up in your city will not be there in a friendly helping capacity. It will be more feudalistic, community against community as they compete for natural resources and remaining resources. You're stuck where you are and may be subject to whatever jurisdiction rule holds the most power. You'll likely no longer be in a populous area. Either you left or they left. The death toll from a prolonged SHTF situation can only be estimated. But even in the low estimates, fully one-third of all the people will not survive in the first 90 days. Gone will be the elderly and anyone with a significant medical condition, those receiving medical treatment or anyone in fragile health. Expect others to die from violence, starvation, dehydration, illness, travel, and exposure to the elements. The reality is that most people can't walk 10 miles, find food or water, or have the knowledge and skills to survive outside the fragile systems they rely upon. The world will look very post-apocalyptic, and either small communities will band together and rebuild by sharing labor, knowledge, and resources, or it will remain very fragmented. By now, you contribute something to the sustainment of your network community, and your community may have established trade or alliances with other communities. As much as it is common to think that as a prepper, you'll be able to go it alone, the reality is that you'll need a community to survive unless you're completely off-grid in the wilderness. For most preppers, that type of wilderness survival isn't a possibility. For most, survival will depend on the cooperation of others. Understand how it breaks down to understand how to survive. There will be no electricity, no water, no hospital, no government, dead telephones, and no internet in a prolonged grid down situation. Know your location and assess your place before you find yourself in such dire straits. Ensure you have paper maps and know the areas of nuclear power plants and dams which may also fell. Knowledge is power, so having police scanners, radios, television, CB radio, ham radios, and some word of mouth will be critical. Any information you can obtain from these resources will be useful. Running water will stop. Pump stations will stop. Gravity-fed water, those big tanks on the hills you see, will continue to flow for a while, but they will run out since they are not being replenished. Fill the bathtub and every container you have, as water flow may stop. Water heaters typically hold around 40 gallons of water so you may need to tap this resource to sustain yourself. You'll need the absolute minimum of at least 90 gallons of water per person to get you through the first 90 days. That includes all drinking, washing, and cooking. You simply cannot survive on less than that. If feasible, strategize and implement a rainwater collection system. From day one, start rationing your food and water. Don't be a healthy fat person after people have suffered for a month. 
you will be alerting people. The same is true for cooking food. Make sure the scent isn't caring or you will attract others. You will need months of food. Most view this as caloric needs alone, but make sure you're looking at the nutritional qualities of the food. Understand that if you are hunkered down, you will not be burning a ton of calories. If you're on the move, you will be burning lots of calories, but will be unable to carry all the calories you need for a journey of a week or more. Ensure that you have 90 days of pet food on hand and remember their water needs are different. They can drink rainwater without ill effect. Cash will only have an initial value. After the first couple of weeks, water, food, and durable goods will be of more importance. Bartering will hold more value in a prolonged or indefinite collapse. Supply chains will stop. The just-in-time delivery system with lean inventories will collapse relatively swiftly. Supply trucks will cease to deliver. Expect stores to be looted before the end of the first week. Take advantage of any supply handouts for appearance and necessities, but don't sacrifice your safety if they turn into chaotic mobs grabbing resources. Even if you don't need the food or water, you can trade for items you need like winter coats, blankets, or other critical items. Prepping for a national disaster that will last more than 90 days may seem extreme, but it should be your minimum goal. If you can survive the first 90 days after a collapse of that magnitude, you'll likely be able to survive the long haul and make it to the rebuilding phase. A return to the way things were before a collapse of that magnitude just isn't a possibility after 90 days. Survival is possible, but you'll inevitably have to rely upon your community and your networks. Apart from the items you've stored up, your significant assets will be your knowledge that you can bring to your community. Take a look at my other videos to understand the things you'll need, and set your prepping goals for a target of 90 days out. You'll find that the longer the time you can prepare for, the more your chances of survival increases. At each significant phase of the 90 days, a week out, two weeks out, etc., assess whether staying in location or finding someplace new is in your best interest. Likely, the window of opportunity is closed, but you'll find a caravan of people planning to move. Your best bet after the first week or two is to stay put. Please feel free to put any suggestions, tips, or information you have in the comment section below. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button and share it with your friends and family and community. If you have any comments or anything you'd like to share, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. Subscribing to this channel is easy, and you'll be the first to receive updates on the new videos I release. As always, stay safe out there.